Let me tell you about a woman named Selena Kyle. Hello, Watchtower Database, and welcome back to whatever this is. Just recently, the limited edition Blu-ray box set for Batman Beyond was announced at the show's 20th anniversary panel at San Diego Comic-Con. While this was obviously the highlight of the panel, there was another piece of news that came out of it that started to raise curiosity all across the internet. During a Q&A session towards the end of the panel, many fans of the show learned that following the production of Return of the Joker, plans were underway for another Beyond direct-to-video movie if the sales for this one did well enough. Despite becoming the cult classic that it is today, initially the sales for Return of the Joker didn't do the numbers that Warner Home Video was expecting, and so the plans for this sequel were scrapped. However, five years after Return of the Joker's release, plot points from that film did end up showing up in Justice League Unlimited Season 2 finale epilogue. Not only did that episode serve as a conclusion for Justice League Unlimited's Cadmus-centric story arc, but it also returned us to the world of Batman Beyond and acted as a bookend for both that show and the DCAU as a whole. I want to warn you that there are spoilers for epilogue ahead. I would hate to spoil it for you without you having experienced it for yourself. So, before continuing with this video, please just go watch that episode first. Trust me, I will be here waiting patiently for your return. 417. Okay, I think that's enough time. Terry being biologically related to Bruce was always part of the plan. In the years since Epilogue first aired, one of the most common critiques that I've seen of the episode is that this reveal came out of nowhere. And look, we can wax philosophical all day long about whether it's a good plot point or not. But the fact of the matter is, Terry being biologically related to Bruce was always in the cards even before we saw it play out on screen. As I've already alluded to earlier, Bruce Tim recently spoke at San Diego Comic-Con about an unproduced Batman Beyond movie that would have revolved around Terry finding out that he was a lab experiment created by none other than, drumroll, Selena Kyle. Who did you think I was gonna say? Amanda Waller? She wasn't even part of the DCAU yet. That wouldn't have made any sense. But seriously, check it out. That's actually where the epilogue ep uh, storyline came from. Just amongst ourselves, Glenn and I were, were throwing out a bunch of different ideas about what we could do for a follow-up if the movie sold well, which it didn't. Catwoman was going to be our, um, our, our lead villain. Um, in, in the second movie. She's the one who cloned. She was the one who cloned uh, Bruce Wayne to, to, to create Terry. So that was gonna be our big surprise. We didn't get to do that movie, and then later on when we were doing Justice League, I went, ah, I remember that pitch. Interestingly enough, this isn't the first time that Tim has opened up about this project. The earliest that I was able to find actually was published two weeks before the final episode of Batman Beyond even aired. In an interview with World's Finest dated December 4th, 2001, Bruce Tim said, I could easily go back and do some more B Beyonds, sure. There was this one DTV story idea that Glenn Murakami and I were toying with involving Catwoman, but it was pretty dark. I mean, pitch black. So after what happened with Return of the Joker, I don't think that one's gonna happen anytime soon. Years later, by July of 2005, some fans began to misremember this quote, thinking that the project had actually been scripted before being cancelled. However, Bruce Tim came by the Toon Zone forums to kind of clear things up, saying, The Catwoman Be Beyond DTV thing was never scripted. It never went beyond a 45-minute impromptu plotting session between Glenn Murakami and myself. Nothing was ever written down on it. In its original, if nebulous, form, it was too similar to both Mask of the Phantasm and Return of the Joker, and several key plot structure points. But even before we had a chance to iron any of that out, the home video department's unbridled apathy towards any more Be Beyond DTV projects made the whole thing moot. As we were plotting out the tail end of the current JLU season, I brought the basic idea up to my co-producers. We quickly realized how it could make a really nifty off-the-wall bonus episode. It actually works way better as the coda to this season than as a standalone Be Beyond film. In fact, we were able to solve a lot of its inherent problems by grafting it onto the Cadmus plot. The post ended with the promise that Tim would reveal more information once Epilogue aired, and oh 
Boy, did he deliver. In the Batman Beyond DTV, instead of Waller, Selina Kyle herself was going to be the one who cloned Batman, staying much closer to the Boys from Brazil setup. Selina hedged her bets and created lots of Bruce Wayne clones and systematically murdered their parents when they reached the proper age. Most of them didn't become manic depressive crime fighters, only Terry and one other, a young boy she adopted and raised as her own son. There was going to be a creepy Manchurian candidate aspect to their relationship with the aging but still disturbingly kind of sexy Selina coaxing the kid into becoming an uber messed up Avenger of evil. Selina's son was going to be the main bad guy muscle of this story, a twisted version of Terry slash Bruce with his own dark superhero outfit and everything. The plan was for him to be bumping off criminals from the Batman Beyond Rogues gallery and possibly even an old timer like Edward Nigma, thus setting the plot in motion. This part was always a bit too phantasm for me, but I did like the main Manchurian candidateness of him. This version of Selina had at some point in the past seen the light after years of Batman nagging her to use her talents to help people instead of just helping herself. She eventually realized he was right, but with born again zeal, decided Batman himself didn't go far enough in punishing criminals. She needed a Batman who would help her eliminate criminals, i.e. kill them dead, and set about creating one. These were going to be true Bruce Wayne clones, not nano-engineered sons. In fact, that had a whole lot of problems built built into it, which we would have had to figure out if we'd ever gotten a green light. If Terry were an exact clone of Bruce, why didn't Bruce recognize him immediately when he showed up fighting the Jokers outside his gate? Since Lil' Matt is patently identical to Terry, how could he also be a clone? Would it make sense for Selina to have artificially inseminated Mary McGinnis twice, five or so years apart? How did Terry's parents escape being murdered when Terry was eight years old? Dwayne's nano-engineered sperm idea neatly solved all of these problems. In addition, there were other aspects of the story that would have needed some massaging. For instance, Selina never seemed particularly tech savvy, so the bonkers clone plot seemed like a bit of a stretch for her, but perfect for Mrs. Waller and her Frankenstein leanings. Also, Bruce was going to discover the truth about Dark Avenger guy being a clone of himself, put two and two together, and realize that Terry was also a Bruce clone, and try to shut Terry out of the case. But that bit was way too similar to what we'd just done in Return of the Joker. Terry thinking he was cursed by Batman, blaming Bruce for ruining his life, even suspecting that Bruce deliberately set the whole thing up, breaking up with Dana, all these bits originated in that impromptu brainstorming session with me and Glenn Murakami. The Terry-Dana breakup bit was kinda cool. Terry and Dana go to the wedding of one of her cousins, and you know how people get at weddings. Dana starts hinting that they should think about getting hitched. After they graduate, of course. And surprisingly, Terry's not completely adverse to the idea. Part of him would like to settle down with this girl he obviously adores, and live something of a normal life. But then he finds out he's Bruce's clone, thinks he's cursed, doesn't want Dana to have anything to do with him, etc. Terry deciding to change the Batman paradigm by actually marrying her at story's end was something we added when writing epilogue. I honestly don't know how we would have resolved the Dana-Terry thing if we'd made the Batman Beyond version. Anyhow, that's it in a nutshell. Despite not being brought back around until years later in Justice League Unlimited, the dynamic of a genetic relationship between Terry and Bruce was actually foreshadowed multiple times throughout Batman Beyond itself, going back as early as the season one episode, Disappearing Inc. It's the old guy, isn't it? What is he? Your father? Grandfather? While the hints started early on, it's difficult to determine if this specific one was intentional. According to Bruce Timm's Modern Masters, production for Return of the Joker didn't start until the same time that the show was picked up for season two. And thus, the Catwoman conversation wouldn't have been had until sometime during or after that season was finished. Whether this particular instance of foreshadowing was intentional or not, it was repeated twice in the show's third season. In both Inkling. She was talking about your relationship with Mr. Wayne. She says that with your dad being gone, it was important for you to have a positive father figure. Bruce Wayne, some father figure. Maybe she's not so far off. And the call. It'll put you one up on the old Batman. He never made it past part-timer. Yeah, he wasn't what you'd call a joiner. Maybe he and I have something in common after all. More than you think, son. 
more than you think. The family aspect even made its way into the show's tie-in comic, as seen in the final two panels of Batman Beyond number 23 by Paul Story. I actually reached out to Paul to see if he had been clued in on the revelation during the show's run, to which he responded, Honestly, I had no clue whatsoever about Bruce's relationship with Terry. I didn't even have the Batman Beyond Bible, much less anything current to the point I was writing. Just read all the Batman Beyond comics I could lay my hands on and rewatched as many episodes as I could. I'd love to claim that I had picked up some kind of vibe from doing that, but that line was more of a comment on the idea of found family, the family that you build rather than being born with. That family is more than blood. So Bruce being Terry's dad ended up undercutting that message in a way, a way I'm perfectly okay with, of course. While Paul's message may disrupt my point on foreshadowing, by the time this comic was published, all three of the episodes that pointed to a family relationship between Bruce and Terry had already aired. So with Paul being left to base his writing on on rewatching episodes rather than behind the scenes material, it seems clear that the themes were prevalent enough in the show to be picked up on, at least on a subconscious level. Keeping on comics for a second, while this movie was ultimately repurposed for epilogue, another story with a similar premise did end up seeing the light of day years later down the road. When Batman Beyond was first brought back into comics in 2010, Adam Beechin's Hush Beyond not only gave us a Catwoman Beyond, but a heavy focus on Amanda Waller's cloning operations, leading to a another clone of a Bat family member offing the old and new rogues gallery members, as well as the added similarity of Bruce trying to push Terry out of the case, this time with an army of Bat drones. Despite so many similarities in plot, it seems as though this was actually just a matter of parallel thinking. When I reached out to Adam Beechin to see if he had drawn inspiration from this canceled film, he told me that he was actually unaware of it entirely until I brought it to his attention. All in all, while the Catwoman plot does seem a bit more clunky than what we saw in Epilogue, I imagine that had it gone into production, the film's crew would have ironed things out and made a fascinating film out of the premise. As cool as it is to get a behind the scenes look at what could have been, personally, I'm glad that we got Epilogue in its place. What are your thoughts on this whole thing? Would you have preferred to see the Catwoman Beyond movie rather than Epilogue? Do you think that the whole genetic tampering thing should have just been left alone? What about all the foreshadowing? Did you guys catch that? when watching the series or did it all just go over your head? As always, I'd love to hear your thoughts, so be sure to leave them down under in the Australia box. And hey, while you're here, if you enjoyed this video and want more DC animated content, why not consider hitting that subscribe button and also clicking the notification bell. I don't have a way to really sign off of this. Usually I say I've been Maddie Washburn. This has been The Vanishing Point. We'll continue to stay those things so long as you continue to stay you. I'll see you in two weeks, but I might see you sooner than two weeks. I might see, I, I don't know when this is, I don't know when this is coming out. I should probably hit the notification bell myself. <laughs>